Tell me about your early work at USGS. Uh, I came to work for the Geological Survey in 1958, uh, working with uh, George W. Morey, who was one of the icons of early experimental work on water-rock interactions at high pressures and high temperatures. Where did you attend college and what did you study? Uh, graduate school, I went to Berkeley. Uh, I did uh, a thesis on porphyry copper deposits. How did you wind up working in Yellowstone? Um, in 1957, Julian Hemley and I were both graduate students at Berkeley, and we were driving from there to Butte, Montana to look at the, porphyry, at the copper deposits there. And we stopped in Yellowstone on the way. And I fell in love with Yellowstone and the hydrothermal system immediately. In fact, I remember very distinctly talking to Julian and saying, I couldn't think of a better job than to be paid to come and actually study the hot spring deposits here in Yellowstone. Uh, three years later, I was. <laughs> I was very interested in looking at what the silica might be in a higher temperature system of Yellowstone. And Don had also done some work in Yellowstone. Uh, so we talked a bit, and uh, he very graciously uh, volunteered to take me and a few of our, my then associates in Washington to Yellowstone to show us around to get started. My intent was to bring uh, a photometer to Yellowstone and actually measure these chemical speciation of silica in the waters just as they came out of the springs. And this was very important for giving me information about how silica might be behaving underground. And so it was the silica that got me to Yellowstone. And uh, I had uh, working with me a uh, Jack Rowe, a chemist, uh, so I had chemical facilities available. And we decided, well, we didn't want to do this um, just silica. Let's collect waters and measure everything we could in the way of major, major elements in the waters, which we did. So that got me to Yellowstone in 1960. What was the focus of your work there? Well, there are a lot of questions we had. Uh, we wanted to know uh, where the waters came from, whether there was a magmatic contribution to the waters and gases or not. Uh, we wanted to know how much water was coming out. And above all, we wanted to know what the temperatures were of the source areas for the specific um, geyser basins and hot springs and geysers in those basins. Uh, so the silica turned out to be the first pathway to this, uh, which was um, uh, through the solu silica solubility work, I came up with what's called the silica geothermometer, which later had a lot of application uh, elsewhere. So uh, then we started in looking at uh, other types of geothermometers involving alkali and minerals, and then uh, mixing models involving uh, mixing of high temperature waters and low temperature waters to estimate underground temperatures. And when the drilling possibility for drilling came up, this was a golden opportunity to verify some of our estimates of what the underground temperatures really were and to see if indeed at depth quartz was um, determining uh, the amount of silica in solution, which had been uh, the uh, direction we were taking, that we felt that yes, quartz should be, and uh, it turned out it was. To what degree was that work contributing to the larger understanding of Yellowstone geology? We had a lot of information when we started working there about chemical compositions going all the way back to a first paper published in 1888 uh, by the USGS uh, looking at the compositions in Yellowstone. Uh, there was a major study done in the 1920s uh, by Allen and Day. Uh, they tried to sample uh, each one of the springs that they could get to in the park. And so when I came on, I wanted to know uh, whether the water compositions were changing in time uh, from year to year or even from season to season in the park. Um, and so um, I also, uh, through the silica work, uh, had published a, uh, the solubility of quartz, and I was very interested in uh, then applying this as a chemical geothermometer. Uh, about then, I attended a meeting in 1965 in um, New Zealand. And when I got there, uh, I found that the New Zealanders had taken my published solubility work and were using it uh, to 
estimate changes in temperature of the Wairaki field. Uh, at that time, in order to monitor how temperatures were changing with production, they had to shut down a well, uh, go through and send a temperature measuring device down, get it out, and this was costing money because they weren't getting the production. And it would take a month or two to do the whole field, and then they found that they could use my calibrated quartz geothermometer and in one day collect sample from all their wells and within two degrees Celsius determine the underground temperatures of the field. So um, uh, I was very, uh, this was for downhole samples. I was dealing with hot springs. And so I really wanted to find out how much change in silica concentration there was in the waters coming up from depth to the spring waters. And the drilling was a marvelous way of getting at what was going on because the drilling allowed me to collect underground um, temperatures. Uh, I was also very much interested in looking at basin to basin and see uh, how they uh, related to how the water compositions in those basins related to one another. And so uh, uh, I was very much trying to find if there are any unifying factors. And by that time, uh, we, I and my associates began to have a pretty good idea, particularly Alfred Truesdale, who was working with me, uh, of what the te uh, temperatures were in the individual uh, basins, and uh, we were expanding on this work. So we were, we were still groping around for a major unifying model, and in, when the drilling started, we didn't have that model yet, but we were on the way. Did your drilling work overlap with Bob Christensen's mapping work? When I first started working in the park, uh, we knew that it was a volcano. We didn't have that much more information except from Joe Boyd's thesis. And so um, about then, Chris started working there. And we had a lot of very close contact with Chris and others because during part of this work, we actually shared field camps in which we've shared eating facilities and, and this sort of thing. And we, um, uh, I was really interested in the volcanic aspect, even though I wasn't, volcanoes weren't my thing, uh, because I knew that the porphyry coppers were, su I, I thought that the porphyries were subvolcanic, and uh, Yellowstone was giving me a, um, a, a bridge between my thesis work and what was going on in Yellowstone. Uh, so I was really interested in talking to Chris a lot. Uh, I went on a um, expedition with Chris to the Mare Plateau, so I had a couple of weeks uh, with Chris in the field. Uh, we were working off of horses, and um, uh, great communication. By then, I'd moved out here, and so uh, we walked down the hall and talked to each other. Tell us about unusual spring activity in the park. I had uh, worked for parts of two uh, either spring or fall seasons uh, in the park, starting in 1960, 61, 62. In 1962, um, this was uh, three years after the Hebgen Lake earthquake, uh, one of the major springs in the park, Barrel Spring, had stopped overflowing. It was right in the uh, canyon uh, that uh, the road goes through from uh, uh, the southern part of the park, uh, to uh, Mammoth in the northern part of the park, the only way to get through, except going out of your way by many, 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 many miles. Um, the Bureau of Public Roads uh, at, uh, was supposed to uh, come in at that time and uh, strip away all of the previously laid down roadbed that went past that spring. Uh, their geologist had determined that the reason that this spring had stopped overflowing was that a crack had determined after the earthquake. And as a result, the water was flowing out from under the road, and which it was. They had hot spring water coming out from under the road. And uh, the uh, superintendent of the park at that time, uh, Mr. Garrison, uh, really liked that spring. He wanted the spring put back to the point where it would overflow again. Uh, so he also wanted all this road material stripped away from uh, by the spring, and they were going to put a, and did put, a bridge over that area uh, where the water could then flow from the spring underneath this uh, bridge rather than over the bridge. 
I was uh, called in. Um, they went for geological survey and called me in as the expert because I was the only person who had any experience at that time in the park to be their safety engineer and also to tell them when they stripped away all of the fill material to get back down to the original slope. I came in and I assessed the situation and I determined that they were having a new spring right under the road. I uh, did this in various ways. Uh, I had a, a thermistor with me and I did a, uh, I got a little spike and I pounded some holes into the ground and I did a temperature therm uh, survey. Uh, determined that the temperatures did not fall off from the spring to that new one, from barrel spring to the new one, but that they had a new spring. I also took an old um, bit of rock salt, uh, a cowlick, and broke it up and put it into barrel spring and then with a conductivity measure uh, determined how long it took the water to get from barrel spring out to this new discharge and found that it took something like an hour. So I knew they were connected, but they were connection was deep. The Bureau of Public Roads also wanted to dig a 10-foot deep trench between the spring and the road and fill it with impervious material, which was going to be montmorillonite clay, and therefore stop up the leak. Well, I knew that this would absolutely destroy the silica center that was coming out there, and if they did that, they would get nothing but new springs and possibly destroy all possibility of even repairing the road or putting in a new road. In fact, they might take the road out forever. So the Park Service wasn't on, for some reason, too good terms with the Bureau of Public Roads at that time. And so I was with the Park Service, and the Bureau of Public Roads was on the other side. And so when we actually got around to digging up the old road, lo and behold, there was a new spring. Uh, furthermore, when we did this, we found that uh, there were at least three or four different roads had been put in, one layer upon the other, and each road was repaired at that same spot where a new spring had come up. And each repair job was by putting in more cement, and each time the new spring would work its way around the cement and eventually come out again. So, um, I, the engineers were going to do the same thing with this new spring. They were going to, to dump it full of cement. Uh, one of the problems was that they had prefabricated the bridge, and one of the bridge abutments was going to be where the new spring was. And they could only move the bridge a few feet one way or the other. So they were going to have this bridge abutment on this cement fill, that plug that hadn't worked in the past. So I said, no, we're not going to do that. And furthermore, we're not going to dig that trench, which was another major problem. Uh, so I designed a cement vault that would raise the level of the water inside the vault to the point where its water level would be higher than that of the spring, reasoning that the new spring would then come out the barrel spring, the shortest way, instead of there. And we then kept it open so that the pressure wouldn't build up in that vault. And we vented the steam to one side and I guaranteed that it would work for at least 10 years, and so now they're finally getting around to doing something about it. Uh, the vault is going to be left, but the bridge is going to be replaced. <laughs> uh, furthermore, uh, we got them to um, not dig the trench, but the contract called for uh, the contractor to uh, dig all this clay out of a pit uh, over near um, the um, uh, Yellowstone Canyon and truck it, which was going to be a very expensive operation, to fill in this trench. So they still insisted on trucking in all of this clay material and spreading it around, which I couldn't get them to stop, and it turned out to be just exactly the wrong thing to do because I think it has led to a lot of the demise of the timbers that they put in place because it allowed conditions to go acid sulfate there. Anyway, uh, as a result of this, uh, the um, John Good, the chief naturalist, and the um, superintendent uh, were fairly high on the USGS. And they felt that uh, we knew what we were doing and that we could handle hydrothermal situations. And this quite possibly could have smoothed the way when we came back to them and said, we would like to do some drilling to really understand what's going on underground. So at that time, uh, the uh, 
personnel in positions of authority in the park were very favorably disposed to the USGS. Uh, they, at that time, could essentially do whatever they wanted. And even though there was some internal dissent within the Park Service about whether we should do the drilling or not, what the superintendent said was law, and we did it. How was the drilling plan developed? This evolved uh, because uh, in anything like this, you want to learn from your past experience. We had an idea of the kinds of environments that we wanted to look at. Uh, we had made some, uh, some decisions about the particular basins. Uh, we had to stay away from Old Faithful and any of the major features in the park, but other than that, we were given pretty much free reign. Uh, we wanted to do our drilling where we could be seen by the public in the um, winter time, or at least in the fall or uh, uh, early spring. During the summer, except for one well, we tried to stay out of the public sight. Uh, the one well where we were in real public sight was the Y5 drill hole, which was right next to Pocket Basin, which was the hydrothermal explosion area. Uh, so, uh, but then we would drill a well, uh, see what we were getting, and then decide on the next one. And so we were pretty much uh, making up uh, our specific drill sites as we went along. In some cases, the Park Service gave us better drill sites than we drilled when we, that we dared ask for, because our sites would have required cutting down three or four trees, and the Park Service would rather have us closer to some of the uh, some of the hot springs and not cut down on these trees. What was learned from the drilling work? One of the things I was really interested in was getting downhole pressures. At that time we didn't have uh, electronic equipment to do pressures and so I came at it from an experimentalist in which I had been using flexible stainless steel tubing uh, to get my pressures to my vessels in the um, furnaces and so on. So I thought I could measure downhole pressures by putting a tube to the bottom of the well and measuring a gas pressure against the what was down there. Uh, this was fairly effective. So we got real temperature measurements, we got good downhole pressure measurements, and downhole pressure measurements were the key to understanding what was going on with the geysers and that sort of thing. We got downhole water and gas samples so that we got real information about what was going on down there. Another thing is that Pat uh, and uh, co-workers, Alfred and Don, had just uh, figured out that these hydrothermal explosions, massive hydrothermal explosions were taking place there and that they were controlled by increase in pressure of this water. I was interested in knowing what happened to the underground pressures and temperatures uh, during the glaciation. So the drill core provided access to fluid inclusions. So I had Keith Barger put onto my uh, project for a while, part-time, to look at the fluid inclusions in core, and we determined that uh, the uh, inclusions showed m major increases in temperatures at various depths. Some temperatures were as much as 280 degrees Celsius, uh, in the past, where present temperatures were only 160 degrees Celsius. This showed that the weight of the glacial ice uh, created a higher underground water pressure and that underground temperatures were able to increase accordingly, much, much, much higher. And so actually during the glacial period uh, at a place called Porcupine Hills in the Lower Geyser Basin, uh, waters were flowing out at the then ground surface underneath the ice at temperatures as high as 160, 180 degrees Celsius compared to 92 degrees now. So toward the end of the uh, ice age, there was a lot of excess thermal energy stored in the rocks, which could then be converted to energy to these hydrothermal explosions. To what degree was drilling a way to get geologic information? Well, of course, it, was, it gave us core. And what the core gave us was not only geologic information, stratigraphy, uh, how deep the uh, glacial fill was, what the uh, different uh, types of rocks were. Uh, it also gave us history, because we could look at the veins and see cross-cutting relationships of veins. We could look at the 
uh, nature of the uh, alteration around the veins and whether it remained the same or not. Uh, we could look at the uh, minerals and the fluid inclusions. So we got history of what had gone on uh, since the uh, materials were deposited uh, that we were looking at. Was it exciting to work in Yellowstone? It's absolutely exciting uh, and fun, yes, yes. I'm accused of never having worked a day in my life. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and as we did this, we were learning things about it. Uh, the questions that we had to start with, we were answering. And the other really exciting thing was that uh, what we were doing did have application elsewhere. Um, at the time I was working in Yellowstone, uh, this wasn't my only job. I was doing experimental work uh, first in Washington and then here. And at the same time, I was greatly involved with uh, developing methods to do ex uh, exploration for geothermal energy resources elsewhere and also ways of uh, helping uh, produce geothermal resources so that uh, they knew what was going on. So I was going back and forth from what I could learn from drilling in geothermal systems around the world uh, to Yellowstone and, and uh, so this was exciting to do. What was unusual about the drilling operation in Yellowstone? Well, uh, it was not considered that interesting. Uh, the economics are at greater depths. You would, at that time, you wanted to have at least 200 degrees Celsius. Today, they're working at much lower temperatures. But then 200 degrees to 240 were kind of optimum. Uh, they weren't going deep enough to get much higher temperatures. Uh, but uh, when you drilled a well, it was very expensive, and to stop and do any kind of measurements in the shallow part of the system wasn't considered economic at that time. And they were also using very big drills and uh, lots of water, so they were cooling things down. You couldn't get good temperatures in the near surface. You certainly couldn't measure pressures. So they would punch right through the shallow zone that we were interested in and go for the deep stuff and then case it off. Describe capping the well that was shown years ago on CNN. I was key to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we put in the wells. Uh, we finished them uh, uh, such that the valve at the top was at below ground surface. There was a cement uh, cellar put around it with a steel door on the top. Uh, the idea was and the actuality was that we kept going back to these wells over time and measuring temperatures and pressures and sampling fluids and gases from them because with time our ability to analyze things got better and better and uh, people from other parts of the world came and they had other interests and in different constituents and so we could give them um, samples. Um, but with time, uh, there were a certain amount of leakages of uh, gases containing hydrogen sulfide, and uh, some of these wells began to be attacked a little bit. And one by one, we cemented them up. Uh, the Y8 well was um, uh, still open, and uh, the amount of alteration uh, increased there and uh, it failed. The, actually, the um, valve at the top was blown off. Uh, this um, was within this locked um, cement uh, cellar. So in late November, it happened. And so we got... Uh, what year are we in? Uh, we were in, oh God, 80... 90, 92, 90, somewhere in there. Uh, so um, I got a call uh, that, e well, that morning um, uh, from Rick Hutchinson and said, we have a problem. I need you up here. And so I was up there that night. Uh, and uh, yeah, it had obviously failed. Uh, so um, what did you see when you got there? Well, I saw a huge amount of water and steam blasting out like a get engine from underneath this locked thing. Uh, so uh, I uh, met with the superintendent of the park 
and I assured him that uh, the USGS would fix it and we would pay for it. Um, I did get a commitment from the Park Service that they would do the do it without bids, essentially. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went back to uh, Menlo Park through my contacts with the geothermal energy industry. I knew that uh, there had been a problem with a slim hole like we had in Honduras. And so uh, it was a hole drilled by a United Nations exploration. So I found out uh, what uh, driller had taken care of that problem and he was actually operating out of Salt Lake City. I contacted uh, that driller and told him the situation and asked if he would be interested in participating and whether they had a r drill rig available. He was, and they did, and he also had a drill foreman that uh, was in Idaho at that time. So the very next day he had his foreman into Yellowstone. Uh, they used a forklift to hold the pressure, the uh, lid down on this pressurized cellar, uh, undid the lock, backed off the forklift, and the steam blew out uh, like a geyser, and they were able to see that the um, valve had blown off. Uh, measurements were made of exactly where the um, pipe was within the cellar. Uh, then with the forklift, closed it up again, put the lock on. So with that information, uh, that week, uh, over the phone, uh, with the uh, driller, we designed a um, piece of equipment that we thought we could force down over this erupting column. Actually, it was a pipe with a couple of valves on it, and uh, we wanted to lower this onto the uh, erupting column. Uh, my particular major contribution was calculating what the thrust was of the fluid coming out of that well because I knew how deep the well was, I'd done pressure measurements in it, uh, so forth. So I knew how much weight we needed on this equipment. Uh, so uh, it was uh, designed within a few days. Uh, we started fabrication before we even had a contract to do it. Um, just went ahead with it and about then I contacted <laughs> the uh, director of the survey and said, hey, we've got to pay for this. <laughs> uh, so he decided, yes, we had to do it. So anyway, we went forward with it. Uh, two weeks later, the equipment arrived on site, uh, ready to go with the uh, CNN, well, actually it was another local TV organization that sold footage to CNN. Anyway, we were being put on uh, TV uh, as we put this thing together. Uh, so we uh, had the drill rig there, we had uh, the new material there, we opened up the top, uh, the thing erupted, we uh, moved the uh, new wellhead equipment over it, uh, came down through this erupting column, uh, uh, stopped the thing up, uh, then we had to uh, go into the well with uh, drill rods, clean it out because some silica deposit in there, uh, come in with a packer, everything worked exactly as planned, uh, we filled it up. Uh, also, another thing, we had to do this so as not to interfere with the small geyser that was uh, a few yards away. We had intersected the uh, channel bringing the water to the geyser during the driller, drilling so that we knew that we were on that channel of upflow for the geyser. And we dare not stop that geyser by cementing up its thing. So we pumped in just enough concrete uh, to uh, uh, fill up the hole uh, without affecting the geyser, and uh, it's uh, doing fine. Go ahead and add to what you were saying. It was very important that we get this well Y8 under control very quickly because the Park Service was closed temporarily while there was a transition between the summer period and the winter period. In the winter period, they had to bring snow coaches in over snow with people. And so after a certain point, the Park Service could no longer plow the worlds. They had to let snow accumulate. And that point was very rapidly approaching. So that we had to get this thing capped before the winter season came on, because if the roads got covered with snow, we couldn't bring in the drill rig and so on. So we had a very small period of time to do this, which we did. Uh, we got it done about two or three days before a major snowstorm was to come through. 
The second thing is that uh, we had budgeted $25,000 to do this repair, which was a princely sum then. We did it for 22. So we came through on time under budget. What about concerns about downhole pressure? When we first started into the park, our background was the pioneering work that Don White had done at Steamboat Springs. And at Steamboat, he'd found that by putting cold water into the well, he could more than balance the pressures, that the w was heavier than the weight of the hot water. And so he could control the wall wells very easily by just putting in cold water. Uh, came the first well that was drilled in Yellowstone. I wasn't on that well, but I heard an awful lot of it, and I was very interested because I was going to have to go and s sit on some of the wells afterwards. Well, they were down a certain depth, and when you drill the, when you pull the drill rods, uh, you're open to the pressures underneath there. Well, they had filled the water, the well with, caught with cold water, and were pulling the rods, and suddenly the well went into eruption, unexpectedly. Well, the drillers departed the drill rig very quickly, <laughs> and so there it was, the erupting well, Patrick Muffler, Don White. Patrick climbed back up on this well that was erupting and began to maneuver the um, machi machinery around to such a point that he could get cold water coming back into the system and get the well back under control, at which point the drillers rather sheepishly, I'm told, came back onto the drill rig and took it from there. Uh, after that, the drillers, I believe, had a lot more respect for the geologists involved. Now, uh, because we found that the underground pressures, fluid pressures underground, were controlled not by the weight of the overlying column of hot water, but were controlled by the weight of the cold water going into the system, we found that all of the hot spring basins were very much um, subject to uh, erupting very easily, hydrothermal eruptions and others, because they were, they were here, you know, really ready to go. Uh, so this also, um, our drilling showed us that the conditions in Upper Geyser Basin and parts of Lower Basin were optimum for sustaining long-lived hot spring activity and geyser activity. My silica information showed that the temperature at upper basin was optimum for not depositing amorphous silica as the natural waters flowed from depth to the surface, that the silica would not deposit as amorphous silica until after it reached the surface. This meant that the system would remain relatively open. Other minerals might deposit, but it wasn't silica, which was the main mineral. So we had one the temperatures were appropriate for not stopping up the system, and two, they had enough energy to give the big geyser eruptions that we see right now. So it really explains why Yellowstone is, why we see it as a, the premier place in the world for geyser activity. How does it compare to New Zealand? The situation is quite similar to New Zealand. Uh, we don't know as much about the deep part of this, at least I don't know as much about the deep part of the system in New Zealand. It's, they have a series of calderas. They have a series of um, hot spring systems. Uh, many of them are producing from reservoirs, uh, source areas uh, for the springs that are about uh, 200 to 240. The geothermal energy production mostly is coming from around 240. Now it's going up to around 300 degrees. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, but the Yellowstone system was much bigger. And uh, what you need to keep the hot spring system going at Yellowstone are, one, a, a very, very large heat source. You need a source of recharge water, which is the big snowfall that we get at Yellowstone, which we don't get at New Zealand. So we have a continuous source of water going on there as the snow melts during the season. And we have a lot of seismic activity which keeps the system open so that if it gets stopped up by mineral deposition, which it does at deeper parts, the seismic activity opens it up again. New Zealand has seismic activity, but it wasn't as seismically active, to my knowledge, as Yellowstone. I still go to the 
web to look at how much seismic activity there is in New Zealand and elsewhere, and it, it just doesn't have as much. And it certainly doesn't have the year-round source of recharge water and the huge amount of recharge water that Yellowstone has. And it may or may not have as high a temperatures underground as Yellowstone has. How has the concept of the heat source changed over time? It's evolving. And different people have different thoughts about what the heat source is and how it's evolving. Uh, when I first started working at the Yellowstone, uh, we knew that it was volcanic. Uh, I, even though I had met Joe Boyd as a grad, he was a grad student, I was an undergrad student, I had met him there. He was working at the geophysical laboratory when I went to Washington, D.C. I knew him mostly as an experimentalist. Uh, I didn't really appreciate what he'd done in Yellowstone. So when I got to Yellowstone, we knew it was volcanic. We knew that there was heat down there, but we weren't even sure whether or not there was any magma left down there. And so then it was through association with Chris that suddenly the whole concept of what was going on uh, came into focus. Uh, very early on, uh, the thought was that we had magma underlying the Yellowstone caldera at fairly shallow depth uh, underneath the whole darn caldera. And that was the working model we had going for. Uh, then uh, I got interested in how deep the water might be going, and so I teamed up with Mitch Pitt here, a seismologist, and we began to look at um, how deep the earthquakes were. At the same time, Bob Smith at Utah was doing very similar work. Uh, and uh, so anyway, um, looking at very precise locations, Mitch and I determined that seismicity was only occurring within the caldera to a depth of about four to five kilometers with the then best data we had available. So I reasoned that the water could not be going into the ground any deeper from the recharge then there's seismic activity to keep things open. So this put a depth of circulation on the hydrothermal system of about four to five kilometers. So this then gave us a, a baseline to uh, uh, look at a hydrothermal system which was mostly pretty much shallow, uh, recharged by meteoric water, and it was kept open by seismic activity that only extended down to about four to five kilometers. Can you please continue on that topic we were con concerned about why there was a difference between what Don White had found at Steamboat Springs, Nevada, and what we had found in Yellowstone. Uh, I can only speculate about Steamboat because I've not worked there. Uh, Steamboat was coming out pretty much of a granitic system. Uh, it was not experiencing a great amount of seismic activity to keep things open. Uh, it was also close to some major faults of, uh, between the basin range and the um, block of rock, which was the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Uh, I can only speculate that the si early seismicity that opened up uh, the hydrothermal system at Yellowstone, or rather at Steamboat Springs, uh, had opened up fractures in the rock, but the system was not so hot that there was a lot of um, movement of really hot waters from underground to the shallow part of the system. So that hot water wasn't getting much hotter than about 200 to 210, 20 degrees Celsius at steamboat. So it wasn't picking up enough silica to stop things up. So even though seismicity may have occurred a long time previously, it was remaining open. And so for that reason, uh, uh, the water was able to get out of the system fairly readily without depositing a lot of silica. Uh, 200 degrees, very little silica is going to come out on the way up. So uh, the pressures in the upflow zones were controlled by the weight of the overlying hot boiling water, not by the weight of the recharge water. And this is saying that the permeability of the recharge water was relatively restricted whereas the permeability along the flow path of the discharge water was really wide open. At Yellowstone, it was just the reverse. The permeability in the recharge path was being kept open by deep seismicity, which was opening up things, and the large amount of silica in the water was stopping up flow out of the system so that we had the reverse going on. 
What was the difference between Steamboat and Yellowstone? A major difference between the hot springs system at Steamboat Springs, Nevada, and Yellowstone is that Yellowstone is a much hotter system at depth. Uh, the drilling that has gone on at Steamboat Springs, uh, the water that is being produced for geothermal energy, is coming from uh, source areas which are only around 200, 210 degrees, something like that. And at these relatively low temperatures, there's very little material that is deposited on the discharge part of the system. At Yellowstone, we have much, much higher temperatures. The waters, deep, deep flowing waters there, dissolve a lot more material and they begin to deposit that material as the water flows toward the surface. So things get very much stopped up. You're kind of putting a stopper, or at least you're putting a, like a, a, a faucet on your water system. Uh, you have high pressures in your household water system because people have valves to close it off. And so at some point you have the source area for your water which is way off in some kind of holding area and it flows underground and water pressures are kept high because the source area pressure is high. At Steamboat it's as if everybody opened up their valve at the same time at the surface and so water pressures have dropped. Describe Don White's role in all of this work. Don White uh, as Patrick noted, was one of the great icons. Uh, he had studied Steamboat Springs. He was, had studied uh, what was going on at the shallow part of the system. Uh, he uh, was very, very generous with his time and his comments and so on. Um, he was very, very generous in coming with me to Yellowstone. Uh, and then when we were in Yellowstone working, uh, most of the time Don would be on a well and I'd be back in Menlo Park and we'd switch places. So I wasn't with him in the field very much. But we argued a lot about what was going on. And Don, most of the time, was right. Uh, and, um, it, and Don would stick to his beliefs until he was convinced that your arguments were sound. And as soon as he determined that your arguments were sound, he was very good about saying, okay, you are right, and very graciously would say, go ahead with what you're doing. And so uh, he was great to work with. He made you really be clear about your ideas. And then if you were right, he'd say, fine. If you weren't right, go back to the drawing boards. Uh, Don was just a, a really good scientist, and a great scholar, and a marvelous gentleman, marvelous to work with. Describe collaborating during field work. Before Chris started to work in the park, uh, Chris uh, looked at all the maps, uh, looked at the topography, and drew out what he thought was going to happen. And so then talking within the park, we would sit down and he would sort of turn a page and say, hey, it is. <laughs> you know, this is the way it is. This is the way we thought it should be, and it is the way it should be. And um, but of course, I was working in a field entirely different than Chris. Chris was doing the geology, and I was working on, on the waters. And so, but uh, we had a very diverse group of people working in the park. Chris was doing the geology, which was marvelous. Uh, Don was sort of an overseer of things. Uh, eventually, working in the park, we had geophysicists come in. We had uh, people working on uh, uh, the uh, glacial picture. Um, uh, so uh, Jerry Richmond was the one I most had. And so it was just every day we were learning something new and we were talking to each other at night and what, what we'd found. And it was uh, just very uh, marvelous to uh, have all of this enthusiasm uh, going on at the same time. Did you work with Ken Pierce? I know Ken. Uh, Ken, I didn't have any direct contact in the park during those early years. Uh, I've had more contact with, uh, with Ken since then, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with what Ken was doing. And then, of course, when I was interested in uh, what the fluid inclusion data were telling us about high temperatures, about seeing how well my estimates of how deep, how thick the ice would be according to what Ken would have to say, and, and uh, yes, this was fine. And then uh, 
also uh, Ken uh, became more interested in the caldera moving up and down, uh, inflation, deflation, and I became very, very interested in the deflation, inflation, uh, deflation, inflation part of the story and uh, related that to hydrothermal activity. But that all was in the later years, uh, not in the earlier years. And so most of my activity with Ken had to do with uh, uh, ideas about um, um, uh, movements of the caldera up and down. What do you think of the media's portrayal of the Yellowstone story? People from the um, television group, uh, it was an English group that wanted to do the initial one. Um, they approached the Park Service and asked somebody from the Park Service to show them around the park when they were first writing the script. Uh, the Park Service suggested that they talk to me. Uh, I was going to be in the park about the same time they were uh, at another meeting. And so I ended up showing the group the, the producer and the writer around Yellowstone uh, to come up with the first storyline. I spent most of that time trying to talk them out of it, but it was obvious they weren't going to talk, be talked out of it. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I was involved with them uh, there. Uh, I thought in general uh, they did a pretty good job of uh, saying what would happen if you are willing to uh, take their assumptions as being true. Uh, this I do not do. <laughs> I, I disagree with their assumptions, but for their assumptions it looked pretty good. Any epiphanies during your career? In terms of whether I made great discoveries while I was on a drill rig, um, the really great discoveries came with the first two wells that were drilled, and those were Don's and Patrick's. And so um, there are lots of moments where things happen, but uh, it isn't that I was in the field and suddenly realized that, that something was there. Uh, a lot of my major um, uh, feelings of breakthroughs actually didn't come in the field. They came when I had time to reflect on what I'd been doing in the field. And so they came at other times. But I had a lot of really interesting times on drill rigs. Um, one, one discovery we made, uh, we um, were trying to uh, drill with, um, uh, uh, against this fluid pressure underground. And so one thing that was tried on the Y3 drill hole, and I think I misspoke earlier about saying that uh, we drilled where the public could look at us and saying it was Y5. No, it's Y3. Uh, Y3 drill hole, um, we started to use some mud to um, maintain this pressure. And uh, it, uh, in spite of the mud, went into eruption. And so instead of having water, which cools down pretty rapidly by evaporation, mud stays hot very long. And so we were getting very hot, sticky mud thrown over everything. The drill rig, the drillers, everything. And so we, we learned very quickly. That was a real breakthrough then that we didn't want to drill with mud. We wanted to strictly stay with hot water. So that was kind of interesting to do. Uh, actually, we were in a situation where um, uh, we were trying to set the first major drill string. Uh, what we would do is we would drill about 10, 15 feet uh, enough uh, uh, pipe in the ground to set a four-inch valve at the surface. And then we would drill through the valve to about 100 feet uh, to the point where we found our first solid rock and then try to put 100 feet of casing in the ground. And so we were only had about 10 feet of pipe in the well and it went into eruption. It was throwing stuff all over the place and we had to get back into it uh, to get our casing in. So we had to lower the um, casing pipe with chain rather than the usual way of from the top of the drill rig. We had a chain around it and we're lowering it in through this four inch pipe hoping that it wouldn't fail. Uh, with the whole thing erupting the whole time we were putting this pipe into the ground. And so that was, uh, by then the mud was all gone, so it was just hot, or hot water coming out. So it was a, a rather exciting time to try to get that uh, pipe into the ground uh, at a place where the uh, uh, public could uh, see what we were doing. Well, was the public watching all that? Uh, the public came through every morning uh -huh. 
uh, with a guided tour. Because by then, uh, Patrick uh, and Don had told the Park Service about what Pocket Basin really was, and we were drilling right on the side of Pocket Basin. So the Park Service had decided that they were going to hold a tour into Pocket Basin to show people a hydrothermal explosion crater. So uh, we were also uh, right on a road, which was a side road, a fountain flat road, but people were going around there. And it was also a road that people liked to go on to see game and at night and so on. So yeah, people were coming by and so we had a big sign out saying USGS, uh, danger, stay away and so on. And uh, I think uh, you have a picture of that uh, that has been given to you. So uh, when the tour came around and when people came around and stopped, one of my main things was to talk to them about what we were doing. And very commonly uh, the initial response was very hostile. What are you doing drilling in this park and so on. And by the time they learned what we were doing and why we were doing it and what we were learning, uh, the response turned right around and people went away supportive. What are your personal feelings about Yellowstone? Well, it's been a very, very important part of my life. It's very, been a very important part of my scientific growing up. Uh, it has uh, been a cornerstone of reality that I can keep on going back to. Uh, I suppose in part, though, it it's, isn't all reality because there's an awful lot of supposition going on. And uh, it's been really interesting to me to watch new techniques come on in which we can learn more. And uh, uh, it has taught me that uh, I really have to keep on evolving what I think about things. That uh, early thoughts uh, are fine, but you have to keep uh, looking at and reevaluating your data. Um, and Yellowstone was always one of the cornerstones. Uh, I kept on working back and forth from Yellowstone to natural systems that I was, other natural systems elsewhere in the world that I was working on. And so, and then you come to Yellow, love Yellowstone. Yellowstone was valuable to us scientifically because it had not been exploited. And it still has not been exploited. And so we can really see a system in its natural state and that being able to look and study a system in its natural state, such as Yellowstone, is it's unique. Uh, and then you know, so many good memories about Yellowstone. Uh, I, I love going back. Describe memorable moments drilling in Yellowstone. After being involved with the Y3 eruption, uh, I went on and sat on Y4, which was relatively uneventful, had some really interesting things happen in it. Uh, then I started the Y5 drill hole that uh, had the um, um, finding of the tuff, ash flow tuff. Uh, actually, I sighted the hole there. And uh, it was at uh, a, a grizzly uh, dump. <laughs> um, we had, uh, again, about uh, 10 feet of casing in the well. And we're uh, trying to set the 100 feet of casing. We were also drilling, again, very close to a naturally flowing hot spring, as we were at the Y3 one. Uh, and as the drillers were trying to get drop the uh, 100 feet of 4-inch casing into the well, it got stuck on the way. It got crooked. And the, uh, it was only the driller and his helper, and they were trying to lift 100 feet of 4-inch casing themselves and weren't having much luck. So I grabbed a big wrench and hopped up on the drill rig with them and the three of us lifted the 100 feet of casing up. I felt something kind of go in my back and felt I'd pulled a muscle or something. And um, uh, so uh, we got the casing in. I was very much afraid that the well was starting to heat up. Hot water was coming out. Uh, I was afraid it was going to go into a major eruption and I didn't want another major eruption on our hands, and I was afraid that we might lose the well because I wasn't sure how well uh, cemented that uh, first 10 feet of casing was. Uh, so we had to get that well under control. And so we, we got up there, uh, I helped lift it, and we got it down there, and I helped this thing go on my back. Fortunately, the next day, Patrick arrived to take over sitting on that well for me. So. Uh, I was able to give it off to Patrick and then drove home. And I had some other things going on. My mother had just uh, uh, sold her house and was moving into a uh, retirement. And I had to help her move and I had to do some other things. And so um, it was then about um, 
six months later that I went in for my physical checkup and told my doctor that I'd had a backache for the last uh, uh, four or five months. And so he said, well, let's x-ray it. And he found that I had two step faults in my l third lumbar vertebra. So is that a broken back? A broken back, right. A broken back with two offset faults. Did the government fix that for you? Uh, well, by then, I was congratulated by my doctor for having saved myself six months in traction. Oh, uh, it, 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 already, it already healed itself. Okay. And so I, I haven't had any real problems with that until the last uh, 15 years. Any run-ins with wildlife that you can tell us about? My branch chief came out to visit me while I was working in the park. And he came out with his wife, who was also a geologist, and their infant child, uh, who was being carried on my branch chief's back, uh, Pete Tolman, uh, who had a um, uh, false uh, arm and hand. Anyway, uh, I was taking them to a fairly remote area to see a, a hot spring geyser that was out there. We were walking through a lodgepole pine forest, and the lodgepoles weren't very tall in that area. And uh, as we were going, I suddenly heard what was seemed to be a large animal move in front of us. And so uh, I suggested, well, uh, we changed direction and started off uh, in that direction. And the next thing I knew uh, was I saw this very large grizzly loping toward us. Uh, what to do? The trees were too small to climb. And so my branch chief and hadn't seen the bear yet and said, said oh, there is a bear approaching. Would you turn around and walk away? Uh, I knew it was impossible to run because you run and the bear might think we're game. Uh, no trees to climb. And so I had my geologic pick. And so I had my pick. And I sort of stood sideways and crouched down so as not to look uh, imposing to the bear. And I started talking to it you great big beautiful bear and so on and it kept coming closer and closer and um, so finally it stopped about uh, uh, 40 50 feet away and it squinted at me and determined who we were and it turned around and walked away. Describe the first time you were in Yellowstone. The first time I was in Yellowstone, my introduction to Yellowstone, it was in the fall it was very cold. Um, Julian Hemley and I, uh, we stopped at a, um, the Tower, uh, Tower Falls campground. Uh, cold, rainy night. We were the only ones there. Julian and his wife and child slept in the car. Uh, I had a sleeping bag and a tarp, and I put it out in the campground, and I put my sleeping bag on the tarp, uh, tarp over me then, and so uh, I was there all alone. In the middle of the night, I felt this scratching on the middle of my self. <laughs> and so I had a flashlight in the car, or in my sleeping bag. And uh, so I pulled the sleeping bag away from my face, and I looked up, and there was this open-mouthed bear about you know, four or five inches from my face. <laughs> I had no idea what the intentions of the bear were. He's probably just curious. But anyway, when you see a, an open mouth of the bear that close to you and you're kind of confined in a sleeping bag, you have various thoughts come through your mind. So I remembered that um, if you have a crocodile that's after you and it's going to eat you, you put a stick in its mouth. So I stuck my flashlight in the bear's mouth and it couldn't close its mouth. And so the bear ran off with my flashlight trying to get it out of its mouth, and then I got out of the sleeping bag and ran after the bear, and it finally got the flashlight out of its mouth, and I got my flashlight back and went to sleep for the rest of the night, sort of. Was that a black bear or a grizzly? It was a black bear. Oh, I didn't know that when it had its mouth open, though. <laughs>